force is strong in my family. My father has it. My sister has it. You have that power too. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy. So the Star Wars sequel trilogy is, let's just say divisive. and Everybody's got their own ideas on how to fix the sequels. And now we're gonna tell you some really fun ideas for what could have been. It is time for the Screen Crush version of the Star Wars sequels. So, 30 years after the fall of the Empire, the fragile peace of the galaxy is being threatened by a conflict between the New Republic and the Rebel Alliance. Right, the Rebel Alliance? Didn't see that coming, did you? As a civil war is about to start, a new threat rises from the unknown regions, one that seeks to reshape the galaxy forever. Two Jedi, a Skywalker and a mercenary, find themselves at the center of a galactic conflict. They are joined by an ex-Imperial warrior whose allegiance is shrouded in darkness. These three heroes will have overcome their differences and their burdens of their legacies, as they will join the heroes of the Rebellion and protect the galaxy from a new kind of Force user. Will the heroes finally be able to bring balance to the Force? This is our vision of the sequel trilogy. This is where the fun begins. Hey person, you got any snacks? Nope. But you always have snacks during busy work days. That's what you're known for. Yeah, that's because I used to stress eat. It was one of my many oral fixation habits that I have broken by using fume. They're the sponsor of this video. Oh, is that a vape? This is not a vape. It's not even electronic and it does not have pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals. Instead, it uses these plant-based cores that are infused with natural flavors to create natural flavored air. I recently started using sparkling grapefruit and it even freshens my breath. Smells very nice. Thank you, thank you. You see, Fume uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Plus, it has adjustable airflow and is designed with these movable parts and magnets for fidgeting, giving your fingers a lot to do, which is very helpful for calming your anxiety. Fume makes switching easy and even fun. They have thousands of five-star reviews from more than 100,000 customers who have used Fume to change their lives and switched when other solutions just did not work. So head to tryfume.com slash screencrush and use the code screencrush to save 10% off when you get the journey pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and everything you need to finally be free of your bad habit. That's tryfum.com and use the code SCREENCRUSH to save an additional 10% off your order today. Now, back to what I was saying. All right, look, we are not here to tear down the sequels. We don't have any new hot takes right now, and I don't want to rehash what so many people have already said about those movies. So let's just dive into our version of the story. The two stories we'll be pulling from as inspiration for our sequels are the Thrawn trilogy and the Legacy comic book series. But this is not an adaptation of these stories, great as they are. We are telling our own story for the sequels. So let's begin with the themes that I want to explore in these movies. The Skywalker saga has always revolved around the Jedi and the Republic. In the original trilogy, the Jedi and the Republic have already fallen, and the Sith and the Empire rule the galaxy. It's a classic conflict between good and evil. The prequels were a deconstruction of this conflict. We see that the Empire rose to power because of the decadence of the Jedi and the Republic, which led to the inevitable downfall of these establishments. Now, the sequels serve as a culmination of the Skywalker saga. Therefore, they must present a fitting conclusion to all of these ideas. But a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. Can Luke learn from the past mistakes of the Jedi and build a better order? Will the New Republic avoid falling into the same bureaucratic pits that corrupted the previous establishment? Will the heroes, old and new, finally break the endless cycle of war and destruction and bring balance to the Force and to the galaxy? Well, okay, Vader technically did that when he killed Palpatine, but you know, we still need to see what balance in the Force actually means for the galaxy. This brings us to the story. So the second Death Star blew up and the Rebels formed the New Republic shortly after. A few years after that, Luke rebuilt the Jedi Order, but it had a rough start. After Palpatine's death, the Empire shattered into countless factions, becoming the Imperial Remnant. Now this meant that the Republic had to fight thousands of battles across hundreds of systems. Now Luke couldn't just step away, not back then. He was a Jedi. Like my father before me. And he had to protect the galaxy alongside Han and Leia. But in doing so, Luke repeated the same mistakes as the Jedi during the Clone Wars. And keep in mind that Luke was the last Jedi. But what about Ahsoka Tano? She's around. All right, let's pretend like this imaginary movie came out in 2015 when only the movies were considered canon. And that's canon. So the absence of the Jedi created this wild west of Force users. Force-sensitive individuals began popping up all over the galaxy. Without proper guidance, these Force users had to find their own way to control the Force. Some used it for good, but most used the Force to gain wealth through criminal means. A few of them even became warlords. When an individual acquires great power, the use 
or misuse of that power is everything. One of these force users is Rey, but more on her later. This crisis led to Luke quitting the war and focusing on training the new generation of Jedi. The problem was that only a few force users actually joined his school for the gifted. And worst of all, the galaxy had serious prejudice against force users. Why? Well, Vader gave everybody PTSD for space wizards with laser swords. <laughs> Sith or Jedi, in this era, most people can't even tell the difference. Luke's first and most talented pupil was his nephew, Ben Skywalker. Wait, he's a Ben Solo, not a Skywalker. Well, you see, Leia took on the name of Skywalker and Han was fine with it. So, it's Ben Skywalker. Just makes it simpler for a Skywalker to be one of the new heroes. Convenient. So my version of Ben is inspired by Cade Skywalker from Legacy. Ben doesn't handle the whole Skywalker legacy thing very well. He feels like he must carry the fate of the galaxy on his shoulders. His uncle is a great Jedi. His grandpa was the second worst dude in the galaxy. Ben was afraid of falling to the dark side. So he just ran away, searching for his own path separate from his family. But Ben didn't become Kylo Ren. He didn't fall to the dark side. Ben is still the son of Han and Leia and their personalities rubbed off on him. He joined a Rangers bounty hunter crew and they fight crime and injustice in the Outer Rim. Oh, and also from time to time, our editor might use some footage of Cal Kestis and some other Jedi from games and animation when we talk about Ben and some of the other characters in this video. Or why is it doing that? Well, most of the footage of Kylo Ren is him being a bad guy, and we want to show some footage that reflects the kind of vision we have for these characters. Anyways, his crew also includes Poe Dameron, the self-proclaimed best pilot in the galaxy, <laughs> and his ship is called the Talon, which is like a space race car. What about the Millennium Falcon? Well, Han still has it. The sequels need new ships, though. New weapons and new worlds. It's new stuff. Life is about, it's about growth. It's about change, but you seem to just want to stay the same. Now, Ben will get his call to action very early in the movie, like Luke did and that leads to him meeting Rey. Rey? Just Rey? Just Rey. She is not secretly a Skywalker or a Palpatine or a Solo or a Kenobi. She is a fresh-faced hero who is not connected to any other Star Wars character that has come before. I mean, this might be the Skywalker saga, but Rey is proof that anyone, no matter their legacy, can be a hero. Hero can be anyone, even a man doing something as simple and reassuring as putting a coat around a young boy's shoulders. Now, Rey is one of the Force users who is finding their own way in this new era. She's not a Jedi, but she is strong with the Force. Are there any important Jedi who are weak with the Force? Well, there's this guy, this guy right here. What an idiot. <laughs> The boy has no skills. Ray is a mercenary in the criminal underworld, and she's got a lightsaber. Where did you get that? Well, there was a certain massacre some decades back which left piles of lightsabers without Jedi to wield them. Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. Ray is working for a powerful black market smuggler called Card. And he can get his hands on anything. He's sort of the Lando of the sequels, only not as cool and he's not really a good guy. Rey grew up on the streets and she had to fend for herself. She might be a mercenary who works for criminals, but she's not a bad person, simply a survivor. When she was a young girl, Rey's parents sold her to some bad people after discovering that she was force sensitive. Remember, the people of the galaxy are afraid of force users. So Rey had to fight to survive and she learned to use the force the hard way. She tries to be a cold hearted mercenary, but she just doesn't have the heart for it. Because because deep down, she's a hero, but her life dampened those emotions. Rey knows how it feels to be weak and afraid. And when she sees other people in danger, she has an innate need to protect them. Because that's what heroes do. Early in the movie, Ben meets Rey and convinces her to be his Padawan. But Rey isn't actually interested in the Jedi lifestyle. She simply uses her master to become stronger so that no one can ever make her feel weak and small again. That is a trauma that she will deal with throughout the entire trilogy. Now, Ben is not even actually close to being ready to be a master. So he is actually using Rey to prove something rather than to actually help her. Or what's he trying to prove? Well, he's trying to prove that he can be a Jedi master and do a better job than Luke and all the other Jedi that came before him. I will be the most powerful Jedi ever. He wants to achieve something on his own in spite of his legacy. And he gets a chance to be the hero when he and Rey meet Finn, and he serves as the call to action for their adventure. But we'll talk about Finn a little later because he is connected to the villains. You should know. I'm a big deal. Before that, let's stay on the topic of legacy and shift to the original heroes, Luke, Han, and Leia. Like Ben, Luke is conflicted about his legacy as a Skywalker and a Jedi. For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice in the old Republic. But their dogmatic ways led to their own destruction. Yoda and Obi-Wan told Luke that he must defeat and kill his father, that Vader was actually beyond redemption. Luke followed his heart. He believed that there was still some good left inside of that shell of pure evil. There is good in him. I felt it. 
that attachment is what actually allowed Luke to bring his father back from the dark. Unless, of course, Obi-Wan was trying to trick Luke into thinking he had to kill him so Luke would have a change of heart. So what I told you was true, from a certain point of view. Piss off, ghost! Which he was doing, but Luke still has to overcome a lot of doubts about the Jedi. Now, all of this does not turn Luke into a depressed, blue milk drinking hermit. He doesn't lose faith in the Jedi, he simply has no idea what it means to be a Jedi in this new era. He's still the Luke we all knew and loved, but he's older, wiser. He's also tired of war and burdened by the grave responsibility that he carries on his shoulders. Now, I know some of you want Luke to be the ideal Jedi Master, but if we're exploring the continuation of Luke's story, there has to be challenges in his way. Otherwise, how could he grow and be better? The greatest teacher failure is. And Luke isn't the only one who struggles with the path forward. The New Republic has its own problems. Han and Leia are trying to hold the damn thing together before another war erupts. What, with the Empire? No, a war from within. You see, fighting a war is very hard. Winning it, though, is even harder. But building a galactic government and then running it? Well, that is, like, entirely different. Leia and Mon Mothma did their best to build a strong government. But this is the first time there's peace in the galaxy. It's a very fragile peace and most senators cling to it so much that they're willing to compromise, like offering ex-imperials pardons and amnesty. The galaxy is just too massive, and even three decades later, the New Republic is still busy cleaning up the Empire's mess. The Imperial Remnant is still a threat, though a much smaller one. The Outer Rim is more lawless than ever, not to mention all the Force users who abuse their abilities. But the New Republic is far smaller and weaker than the old one. To keep the peace, the Republic had to enforce order by force. The Jedi served as the Republic's moral compass, but without them, things get messy. There's a reason why you separate military and the police. One fights the enemy of the state, the other serves and protects the people. And the military becomes both, and the enemies of the state tend to become the people. So everything Luke, Han, and Leia did was for nothing? The New Republic is just kind of terrible? Okay, I know what you're thinking, and I'm not just undermining the Rebellion or deleting the success of the original heroes, but this is something that needs to be explored. The Rebellion was comprised of many different factions with different views on war, but they had one common enemy. While the Imperial Remnant is still around, the New Republic is no longer united for one cause, and their opposing views now divide them. This leads to a new Rebel Alliance faction being formed from within. After the Empire fell, these Rebels kept on fighting. Some of them had to get their hands dirty to hunt down the Imperial Remnant. But now, some senators and politicians frame these rebels as warmongering soldiers who cannot give up their war. The government totally sucks. So these rebels oppose the direction the New Republic is heading in. They think it's a betrayal after everything they have sacrificed. These men died for their country and they weren't even given a goddamn military burial. So what happens when these rebels who rose against an oppressive establishment now oppose the government that they themselves built? What happens when the government sees its heroes as the villains? So it's a galactic powder keg about to explode. So wait, who are the bad guys? I don't get it. The Republic, the rebels, the Empire, what's going on? Well, Doug, I am telling a far more complex story here. But don't worry, there are distinct bad guys in the sequel trilogy, and we're going to get to them in just a moment. The sequels must explore the New Republic. The Skywalker saga is a generational story. It is about legacy passing down from one generation to the next. The most interesting story is whether or not the new generation could learn from the past, evolve, and find a better path for the future. So Luke handles the Jedi problems while Han and Leia, who are still together by the way, are desperately trying to prevent a war between the Republic and these new rebels. Han is a top general while Leia is part of the government. They have to be the responsible adults in the room and work with both sides. As the civil war is about to begin, a new threat is rising from the ashes of the Empire. And this brings us to the real villains of the sequels, starting with Timur Daro. No way, that's the cool guy from Ahsoka. All right, so full disclosure, we came up with all these ideas like way back, long before Ahsoka introduced Balin's skull. Now, Daro has some similarities to Balin, but he is not the same character. So, Daro is a strange combination between an evil version of Qui-Gon Jinn and like a less insane Thanos. Daro is over 200 years old. He ages slowly. He was a Jedi Master who had a fallen out with the Council decades before the Clone Wars. Now, he had a vision, witnessing the downfall of the Jedi and the Republic. He interpreted the vision as proof that the Jedi lost sight of their role in the galaxy, and that the Sith would destroy them. And you know what? He was right. The Council rejected his vision, so Daro quit the Jedi and traveled to the Unknown Regions with a few disciples. Why there? Well, because that's where the Jedi Order was first formed. He traveled to the Dawn of the Jedi to find a better path for the Order and for the galaxy. Fall of the Jedi, rise of the Empire. It repeats again and again and again. Daro came to the conclusion that the Jedi's fear of the dark side is their biggest downfall. He believes that a true Force user must find the discipline and balance to walk the fine line between the light side and the dark. Daro abandoned the Jedi ways and formed a new order, the Knights of Ren. 
We are no Jedi. Now they are dark Jedi, using the light and dark sides of the Force. They also operate like a military force, as opposed to the monk-like Jedi, sort of like Force-using Mandalorians. So this makes Daro the perfect antagonist for Luke and the Jedi. He's a former Jedi Master, the only living Jedi from the Old Republic, unlike Luke. Daro has the conviction in what he's doing, something that Luke lacks at this point of the story. Daro and the Wren challenge the very idea of the Jedi. What is the right way to use the Force, and how can the heroes bring balance to the Force? So, fast forward to present times. Daro leads the Wren back from the Unknown Regions. Daro believes that he and his knights can finally bring true peace and order to the galaxy. He doesn't seek to rule or build a new empire. He truly wants to end the cycle of war and destruction, on his own terms, of course. Daro detests Palpatine and the Sith, but he agrees that there must be a strong, organized military force, like the Empire, to enforce order. It is an unfortunate evil, but speaks to a greater truth. One must destroy in order to create. This is why Daro joins forces with the Imperial Remnant. See, Daro is willing to work with anyone to achieve his goals. And so, he takes over the Remnant and uses everything that Palpatine built, aka Palpatine's legacy. Daro renames the Empire to call it the Union, not to be confused with the Techno Union. Techno Union. So, Palpatine isn't going to somehow return from the dead. Somehow. He's dead, and he should stay dead. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities some consider to be... Well, you're dead now, so shut up! But his legacy lives on through Moff Gideon. The same guy from The Mandalorian. Well, it's the same name and the same Giancarlo Esposito, but my Gideon is more like Thrawn. Why didn't he just use Thrawn then? Well, there are so many expectations that come with Thrawn, but we want to tell our own story with our own characters, and the story we have in mind for Gideon just doesn't work if he's Thrawn. These are unfortunate, but acceptable losses. So, Roan Gideon was one of Palpatine's most trusted moths, and he is a brilliant tactician. He led the Imperial Remnant until Daro took over. Now, while working under Daro, he plans to overthrow him and restore the Empire to its former glory, which makes him the heir to the Empire. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Also, the Union uses battle droids instead of stormtroopers, just to bring it all full circle. And also, I really like battle droids. Roger, 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 roger. And get this, Gideon has a son, and his name is Finn. So Finn is basically a metaphor for Plato's cave. He lived most of his life being told that the Empire was good and the rebels were the villains. So, like many others, he was brainwashed by his father's propaganda. The Imperial Remnant is not the juggernaut war machine that it used to be. They are small cells who are being hunted down by the Republic forces. Now, from Finn's point of view, they are fighting for survival, fighting to save the galaxy. This was the only truth that he ever knew. So naturally, Finn is Team Empire. But once he comes out of his cave and he sees the galaxy for what it truly is, this is when Finn begins questioning what he knew all of his life. And that's a really fascinating story arc for a character who wants to be good, but happens to believe in a really bad cause. Now, Finn is not Force-sensitive, but he is a very capable soldier, and Gideon taught him a lot of politics, and Finn is going to be integral in saving the Republic from itself. However, before he achieves redemption, Finn seeks to prove to his father that he is a worthy heir and a true patriot. So, at the start of the movie, Daro sends Finn on a mission with Selene, a Knight of Ren, and she is like a daughter for Daro. Their mission is to find Ben Skywalker and convince him to join the Knights of Ren, and then to use Ben to infiltrate the rebels and incite civil war. Now, obviously, Finn and Selene keep their connection to the Empire a secret, otherwise Ben would just cut them down. The thing is that Ben is very susceptible to starting this war himself, as well as susceptible to the dark side. He believes that it falls to him to bring peace and order. While Luke teaches that the Jedi must be peacekeepers, Ben believes that the Order must enforce the law and fight injustice. And Ben already blames the Republic for its inefficiency. However, his parents and uncle are key figures in the Republic, so this puts him at odds with his entire family. So, the son and the nephew of the Heroes of the Rebellion will now lead an uprising against the Republic. Daro believes that once the war starts, everyone will see that the Republic and the Jedi were always destined to fail. And this is where the Union will arrive as saviors, and the Ren will end the war and usher in a new age of peace and order. I have brought peace, freedom, justice, and security to my new empire. Now, Rey does not care for the Republic, but now that she's being trained by Ben, she starts to like the idea of using her abilities for more. At first, she wants to use the Force to hurt those who hurt others. Something inside me has always been there, but now it's awake, and I'm afraid. But 
her arc leads her to become a protector who understands what it means to be a Jedi. She will have two masters, Ben and then Luke. Each provides her with an essential lesson to find her own path as a Jedi and a hero. Ben and Finn allow themselves to be defined by generational legacy. Finn's father is an Imperial while Ben is a Skywalker. Their past dictates their choices. It becomes a burden that corrupts them. Rey, on the other hand, is no one, literally. Her parents were nobodies. She has no grand legacy. They're filthy junk traders who sold you off for drinking money. However, her past haunts her. So once she accepts it, she will be free to forge her own path. Ben and Finn shift from one spectrum of morality to the other. Finn becomes a good guy since he's able to find a better path. Ben, on the other hand, joins the Knights of Ren because he's attempting to rectify his family's mistakes. Rey is in the middle, on one hand representing the gray area between the light and dark, and on the other serving as the balance of the Force. She can't do that. Shoot her or something. Like Ben, she has the capacity to turn to the dark side, but she finds her inner balance throughout the sequels and learns how to overcome her past and forge a better future for everyone. See, that's the beauty of the Star Wars heroes. They have the willpower and the integrity to withstand everything that is thrown in their way, to endure every test, and to remain good and true to who they are. I'll never turn to the dark side. I am a Jedi. By teaching Rey, Luke is going to become a better Jedi, since even a master never stops learning. Luke understands that the Jedi forced their members to fit into one uniform mold, no matter what their personalities were. They pushed away anybody who did not fit in with their strict code. And what did that do? From my point of view, the Jedi are evil! This is why the Jedi failed. Luke tried to do the same with Ben, and he pushed his nephew away. Rather than Luke following the old ways, he finds a new path for himself, free from the legacy of the past. He provides Rey and his other students with a strong moral foundation, teaches them not to repress their emotions, but to accept them, but not to let them control and consume them. He trusts them to find their own path, just like he did when he faced Vader. So with this new understanding, Luke will break the cycle of destruction. Ben will join the Knights of Ren. However, he does not go full evil. He's more of an anti-hero at war with himself. Put aside the Ranger. Become who you are born to be. And this is where Rey, Finn, Poe, and Luke, and of course Han and Leia will help him find redemption and his place as all the good guys will unite against the Knights of Ren and the Union. So that is our overall concept for the sequels. Wait, that's it? Yeah, why? I just thought you would go over like your whole fake movie, like all the scenes and all that stuff. Well, we might in the future, but we just wanted to give all of you our ideas for what we would have done with episode seven and the sequels as a whole. But I would love to go deeper into this story and actually create the full plot for this trilogy. Do it. Let me know what you think. Did you like it? Did I just kill Star Wars again? And if you want to see more of this story, we would love to do it. Just let us know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.